Um, Ricky tried to uh, encourage me to uh, be brief and make some uh, clear statements. Um, are you getting an image? Um, so I'd, I'd like to um, basically try to explain four issues or attitudes that have sort of been been uh, taking shape in our office over the last uh, 10 years. Uh, and the first one is the whole sort of, uh, you could call it the image of sustainability, uh, which is quite well captured by this photo that was taken at the United Nations Conference on Climate Change in Copenhagen three years ago. And as you can see on Merkel, and I think especially Sarkozy, uh, it, it wasn't exactly a, a party. Uh, it was a complete uh, fiasco. Uh, none of the goals that were established for the summit were met, and the general sort of discussion about sustainability was drowning in this sort of typical misconception that sustainability is a question of how much of our current quality of life we're willing to sacrifice in order to afford being sustainable, uh, which is obviously not a very sort of uh, attractive or competitive uh, image. So when, when we were asked to design the Danish pavilion for the Shanghai uh, um, World Expo, where the subject was sustainable cities, we thought, what if uh, sustainability could increase quality of life? Uh, so, uh, like briefly, we decided to consolidate all of the elements of a typical Danish city uh, into this pavilion, uh, this sort of loop, uh, because like 40% of all the Copenhageners commute by bicycle, so you could actually bicycle uh, through the pavilion. Uh, it was complete with the blue bicycle lanes of, of Denmark. You had uh, the Danish city bikes that we've had for the last 20 years. Um, so you could bicycle through the pavilion. Uh, it also made you, uh, it made it like the perfect museum for impatient people, because you could do the whole thing in two minutes uh, <laughs> if you were working hard uh, without missing a single exhibit. Um, also, another aspect of uh, Copenhagen that actually makes Copenhagen that that makes Copenhagen sustainable, but also more enjoyable, is the fact that our uh, port has become so clean that you can swim in it. Our first project was the design of the Copenhagen Harbor Bath that extends public life into the water. So we recreated this experience uh, in China, allowing the visitors to feel how clean, if not how cold, uh, Danish harbor water is. Um, and finally, uh, sort of as a way of getting the Chinese to, to actually turn up, we thought um, we were looking for common denominators between Denmark and China. And we discovered that in the Chinese public school curriculum, they actually have three fairy tales by Hans Christian Andersen. One of them being the story of the Little Mermaid, the national symbol of Denmark. So we proposed to move her to China. Uh, the Nationalist Party freaked out uh, and uh, tried to pass a law against moving the mermaid. So I had to go to Parliament and actually argue her case, and, and we got her. And then we had to get her through Chinese customs uh, <laughs> and, uh, and, 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 into the, and into the pavilion. But that was essentially the first time where we got this idea of hedonistic sustainability that sustainable cities can actually increase human enjoyment rather than being a sacrifice. Uh, at the time, we got invited to uh, do the headquarters for the energy company of Shenzhen, the most uh, industrious and most uh, energy consuming region in the world. Um, and we thought um, it could be interesting to make uh, it uh, like uh, the design about energy. So uh, it's essentially doing a 100,000 square meters office building in, uh, uh, in a humid subtropical climate. Actually, Alejandro was on the jury for this uh, competition. Um, and, and basically, there's a dilemma. You want uh, daylight and views, but you don't want thermal exposure and glare. And as a result, we designed uh, the facade like this sort of zigzag uh, that opens towards uh, the views uh, and the daylight to the north, but blocks all of the direct thermal exposure from the south. As a result, when you look south, you see this sort of veneer wall in bamboo. And when you turn north, it becomes an all glass facade. Um, this is the lobby, uh, the same phenomenon. And uh, that basically sort of can work that you can make these little openings uh, for entrances or for the executive lobby for the, for the directors, turning it into almost like this sort of easy Miyaki fabric. Uh, and without any technology, without any sort of mechanical moving parts, this saves 30% of the thermal exposure and, and air conditioning consumption. Uh, we did the project with, uh, with Arab from Shanghai, but essentially there is no technology. It's purely the fact that the building looks different, also makes it perform different in terms of its energy consumption. So maybe that also uh, sustainability could have like an aesthetic 
positive uh, side effect. And we broke ground uh, uh, two weeks ago, uh, finally. They, they put uh, gold dust in the soil when they do groundbreaking in China. Um, another another uh, element we've been looking at is that when you're doing urban interventions, uh, of course, um, uh, this, the whole sort of public element is a major part of it. Uh, and uh, in, in uh, one case, we took public participation to an extreme uh, way beyond uh, uh, like normal sort of user involvement. Uh, you might have recognized uh, uh, that, uh, or like remember that Denmark had, this could also be the London outskirts or the Paris outskirts, but this is actually downtown Copenhagen. Uh, when we had the uh, Muhammad cartoon crisis, uh, a Danish uh, newspaper commissioned uh, 10 cartoonists in a sort of misconceived crusade for the liberty of speech to make fun of the Prophet Muhammad, pissing off uh, a billion Muslims, uh, including these boys. Uh, this is actually our office in Copenhagen, uh, and we're located in the most ethnically diverse neighborhood in all of Denmark. There's 60 different nationalities, and all of them being Muslim. So uh, when we got invited to do uh, an urban space, this is uh, 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 this sort of uh, urban space in Copenhagen. Um, uh, it's a, a kilometer long, a form of train tracks. We thought this project had to, really had to deal with uh, public participation and the sort of sense of ownership and integration in, in this sort of uh, challenged neighborhood. So we designed what we called uh, uh, the red square, uh, where everything is shades of red. Um, I think you're actually cropping the image uh, a little bit. Uh, then also the, the black market, where everything is, uh, is black. Uh, and finally, uh, the black market sort of uh, rolls into the green park. Um, and then rather than sort of plastering this uh, urban space with, uh, uh, with Danish design, we thought we could reach out to the sort of uh, local community, almost like tapping into the global vernacular experience uh, of the local residents, asking them to nominate elements from their other home countries. Uh, so um, almost creating this sort of global best practice so through the local media and through a series of meetings, we had people nominate elements from their other home country. And the main point is that we don't eat Chinese food to be nice to the Chinese. Uh, it doesn't have anything to do with pol political correctness. It's because sometimes we want noodles. Uh, and the same thing, we don't put a Moroccan fountain in the middle of Copenhagen to be nice to Moroccans, but it's because they actually have this amazing tradition for uh, architectural water features. Um, from Jamaica, we have this like outdoor sound system that you can plug your iPod to. Uh, I, I know that the neighbors hate this, uh, this part of the project. Uh, and then almost like in an art exhibition, we put in these little signs on the ground uh, that actually say in Danish and the local language uh, what it is and where it's from. Uh, we have this like uh, a muscle beach that combines elements from Thailand, uh, India, uh, Iraq, and, and Turkey. Um, also, like d different cultures have different specialties. Uh, there's a, a litter box from, uh, from England, cast iron, and also this sort of pedestrian uh, signal. Uh, like this, this bollard is from Ghana. Uh, it's Denmark, so we need a lot of bicycle parking. This uh, rainbow is from, uh, from Finland. Even down to the signage, this is uh, the sign on the red square. It's the actual sign from the red square. Uh, this is a bus stop from Kazakhstan which is like way cooler than the typical uh, Danish uh, bus stop. We, we, uh, we did this uh, uh, elephant from Ukraine. We had to make a copy because the original from, was from Chernobyl and was uh, radioactive. Um, and even down to the manhole covers, uh, because the majority of the immigrants uh, are, are uh, Islamic background, from Tel Aviv we have this nice uh, uh, manhole cover that we think is pretty much indestructible. Um, we even found palm trees in, in China that, uh, that grow in, in Danish climate. Uh, so it became this sort of almost like a sort of a safari into a sort of urban diversity. And I think when you look at the benches, it's almost like a cultural study. From Mexico, you have a love seat uh, where the people sitting next to each other can actually look each other into the eyes. From Belgium, a bench where everybody looks away from each other. Uh, <laughs> So like, uh, you have like this sort of almost like a little display of, uh, uh, of, different, uh, of different cultures. Uh, finally, down to the, the lighting, uh, as a way of creating these colorful lights, one of the main reminders that you're in a foreign culture when you're traveling is actually the advertisement. So as these sculptural colorful lamps, we have neon signs that advertise stuff you can't buy in Denmark. Uh, my, uh, you even have uh, Osborne the Bull from Spain. 
Uh, my favorite one is this, it's a dentist from Qatar. Uh, and of course on the red square you have this sort of uh, ensemble of, uh, of former Soviet and, uh, and communist uh, uh, ads. We actually, together with Superflix, the artist group, uh, we made an app that actually tells the story behind each of these, uh, uh, these elements. Um, that brings me to the sort of the last uh, uh, idea that we're sort of looking into right now is um, the sort of notion of social infrastructure. As the previous speakers mentioned, the High Line is a repurposed uh, train line. Uh, uh, Tate Modern is a repurposed power plant. So there seems to be this law of uh, nature or cities that the infrastructure of the industry of the past gets reinvented as the infrastructure for culture and leisure of the present. Um, one example is in Vancouver, uh, right where Granville Bridge hits downtown. Uh, uh, our client had found this site that was like a, a wasteland shredded into pieces by the, uh, the bridge above. Um, we, uh, we wanted to sort of try to, to densify it. Um, we started mapping the, the simple uh, sort of uh, inhibitions of the site, setbacks from the streets, setbacks from the bridges. Then the city has made a rule that they don't want anybody looking straight into heavy traffic. So there's a 30 meter setback from the, from the highway. Then there's a park where we can't cast shadows. So finally we're left with this sort of tiny triangle, 600 square meters, that, that's actually too small for development. But since our client owns all the land and the 30 meters have to, has to do with doing minimum distance, as soon as we get clear of the highway, we can sort of come back out, maximize the amount of the nicest apartments. So when you drive over the bridge, it's almost as if someone is pulling a curtain aside, sort of a welcome to, to Vancouver. And underneath the bridge, uh, we try to see if we could actually create a lively community uh, with sort of shops and offices uh, and, and actually exploiting the underside of the canopy as a, as a, as a good thing. Uh, uh, almost like the sort of the high line in reverse because cars still drive on top. Um, and one of the things we discovered is that, that there's a lot of like uh, nice photo artists in Vancouver uh, and uh, Jeff Wall and Rodney Graham started actually using light boxes for their photos. So we proposed to turn the underside of the, of the bridge into this upside down uh, art gallery, almost like the 16th chapel, uh, uh, but of contemporary art underneath a, a highway bridge. So as, as a way of starting to sort of reinvade these sort of uh, leftovers of, of infrastructure. Um, and that leads me to the last project that somehow maybe takes this idea of rather than just reappropriating the infrastructure of the past, maybe you can make new hybrids where sort of public and private investment, uh, utility and culture can actually be sort of coinciding uh, proactively. Uh, we got invited by the 10 municipalities of metropolitan Copenhagen to look at a master plan for the future, looking at a new train line uh, connecting them uh, around the outskirts of, of Copenhagen. And we thought, if we want to look at the future of Copenhagen, we can't just look at the outskirts or even just at Denmark. On the other side, we have uh, Sweden, connected by the bridge between uh, Malmö and Copenhagen. It's the most prosperous and, 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 uh, and most sort of densely populated part of Scandinavia. And by adding a small uh, five kilometer bridge to the north, we can turn it into a single metropolitan loop where no area is further away than uh, 40 minutes by public transport. It also connects all of the best businesses uh, in the region. Uh, and, and by making a binational urban master plan, we can also uh, introduce pink in a flag uh, uh, for the first time. Uh, but, but more importantly, it's exactly the same uh, size as the San Francisco Bay Area. And the general philosophy is that it's not just an infrastructure for transport, it's also a smart grid that combines the hydroelectricity of Sweden with the wind power of Denmark, uh, waste management, water management, and, and, and the general idea is that infrastructure is always combined with pr uh, uh, programs for culture, commerce, or, or education. And as the first sort of specific building we're doing within the Loop City, as, as we call it, uh, we got invited to do uh, a project on the waterfront of Copenhagen. It's not going to be an opera house. Uh, it's going to be a, a power plant that makes uh, uh, energy and district heating out of trash. Uh, essentially, a ton of trash is almost the same as two barrels of oil. Uh, but it's a big, ugly box. It has to be close to the city for the sanitation and for the uh, district heating grid. Uh, it's going to be the tallest and biggest building in all of Copenhagen. Um, it's going to be right next to the marina and right next to where the local boys go uh, water skiing. Um, and speaking of skiing, in Denmark we have snow, but we have no mountains. Uh, but we do have mountains of trash. Uh, so uh, people actually go 
six hours by car to Branes in the south of Sweden. Because of the sheer magnitude of this power plant, we can do two thirds of Branes on top of this, uh, this building. So we designed the roof as this sort of continuous uh, roofscape uh, where you actually get uh, a green, a black, and a blue ski slope uh, on the roof of it. Uh, so miraculously, we won uh, the competition based on this idea. So uh, from 2016, you have to watch out for Danish skiers in alpine competitions, because now we can actually practice. Um, so, um, and you know, we, we started doing this sort of very modular uh, facade that filters daylight uh, into the building. So the building almost becomes like this man-made ecosystem that harvests, harvests the local resources, uh, turning it into a single sort of man-made ecosystem of, uh, of heat, uh, flow of, uh, uh, of trash, water, electricity, uh, uh, district heating. Um, and as a last element, uh, and maybe to wrap up, this is going to be the cleanest waste to energy power plant in the world. Uh, but it still has CO2 emissions, uh, very little, uh, but it still has a certain amount. And together with Realities United from Berlin, we uh, designed the mouth of the chimney uh, as this chamber that uh, compresses uh, CO2. Uh, and when there's 200 kilos of CO2, uh, the chimney puffs a gigantic smoke ring. Um, and essentially, on, on one hand, we like it that it's sort of the, the ultimate artistic uh, expression of hedonistic sustainability, that something that used to be a problem turns something pay playful. Uh, but I think more importantly, um, one of the main drivers of behav behavioral change is knowledge. That if people don't know, they can't act. Uh, and nobody really understands what uh, a ton of CO2 is. It's this abstract, untangible, ungraspable thing. Uh, in 2016, if you come to Copenhagen, all you have to do is count uh, uh, the smoke rings. And when you counted five of them, we have just emitted one ton of CO2. So it's this sort of uh, almost like exercise in extreme uh, uh, sort of transparency. So just to sort of sum up the, the, the four ideas, like this idea that to focus on sustainable ideas that can actually increase life quality to make it desirable and not just mandatory, uh, to so find ways of engaging the public to actually contribute to the aesthetics uh, of the city. This idea of exploring new hybrids between public and private investment, utility and, and culture. And finally, to quote uh, Littlefinger from Game of Thrones, uh, knowledge is power, that if you can actually sort of make these like abstract elements very concrete, you also uh, provide information to make uh, sort of informed decisions about uh, the future. So, three, four minutes. Sure. Um, thank you, Berkey. That was in, in immensely fun and entertaining and, and interesting. Um, but I have to ask you about the um, the park, which which looks. Um, I'm sorry, I haven't seen. It, so I'm going to ask this in an aggressive way. What, what's the difference between it and and Epcot or Disneyland? A small, ironic version of it. In other words, what actual social change does it enact? Yeah, I think it's a question of authenticity. The fact that. Um these are actual uh, everyday objects from the, from the citizens uh, that actually live there, s other, uh, other element of everyday. So for them, it's actually sort of this sort of recognition uh, that uh, in a way, this urban space becomes m a much more truthful portrait of contemporary Copenhagen mm -hmm. rather than sort of, um, sort of petrifying some kind of a uh, old fashioned perception of Danishness it actually truly reveals the sort of cultural diversity of, uh, of contemporary Copenhagen. And, and, and that's also what, in the end, it, there is no irony. There's maybe a little bit of humor, there's maybe a surprise and almost surreal just juxtaposition, but also surprisingly, when you go there, uh, it, it became much more uh, tasteful uh, in a way than we had imagined. Like we thought, okay, we're gonna like resign any kind of authorship and just like let the dogs loose. But in a way, uh, it, it has, uh, it has authentic authenticity, and also when you go there, you see that it's actually being used. And, and uh, the, the Burka ladies uh, look as, uh, as, you know, integrated as, uh, as the ska skateboard kids and as the senior citizens, so. I mean, do you, but, but d therefore, did you conceive it as a kind of space that would, you, sh you showed first signs of protest after the, the cartoons. 
I mean, did you see it as a space that actually would be politicized in some way, or just simply, s uh, as you say, a form of acknowledgement of multicultural reality in Denmark? I mean, I, I think it's a, it's almost like sort of an extreme exercise in inclusion. Uh, that um, I think one of the the core fundamental aspects of uh, of uh, urbanity is that it's an exercise in having a lot of different people from a lot of different backgrounds, a lot of different uh, cultures, languages, uh, age groups, uh, uh, gender, whatever, uh, co uh, cohabiting a, a limited amount of space. And, uh, and rather than subjecting it to some kind of a uniform regime, uh, this became an exercise in, okay, what does it actually look like if there is space within this master plan for everybody to realize their desires in a way? And also as a collaboration, it was a collaboration between us, uh, Tupotec, a landscape architect office, and a, an artist group, Superfix. And also for us, it became quite easy to collaborate. Normally you would have like everybody fighting over the crayon. Uh, uh, but here there was actually space for everybody to fulfill uh, part of their desire on the condition that they would also leave space for everybody else to have theirs. Uh, fantasies come true. Can I just ask you a final question about um, how do you get these projects accepted? <laughs> I mean, th there's something about the presentations at this table today where the, the notion of energy, electricity, comes down to the individual. I mean, we've seen it, no? In the way you talk about things. Um, I mean, that last project, how the hell do you convince people to put quite a lot of money into that. How much are you therefore, in an interesting way to us, leveraging this discussion that this conference is having about the electric city, about the, 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 the potential of the digital age, in such a way that you're sort of buying into a sort of sense of guilt, which I think is a very northern European notion. Okay, let's spend more money, but we're blowing five things up in the air and everyone is informed. But literally, tell us, how do you convince them? I, mean, I think, um I mean, I mean specific specifically, uh, the, the smoke rings, there was like a small uh, element of uh, an art budget. But I think they had That's foreseen... The big, uh, not, not just the, the whole thing. Yeah, but exactly. No, but uh, I, th I think it's, it's actually because uh, we have, over the last maybe decade or a bit more, been very sort of uh, active in the public debate about architecture in Denmark because all of our projects have arrived with uh, a journalistic angle, if you like, where the project is not just some kind of fair, fair complete. We've been very open about what are the criteria that this project addresses, what are the concerns and demands uh, of sort of everyday uh, Danes that this project actually manifests. Uh, and in that sense, I think we have slightly uh, twisted uh, the realm of possible or possibility in Denmark. So I think 10 years ago, we could not have submitted uh, a power plant with a ski slope on the roof and expect it to be taken serious. Specifically, the first project we did in Copenhagen uh, was a proposal with a, a major Danish theater group to make the Royal Danish Theater um, on a barge that would make it uh, capable to tour uh, in the summer and visit the provincial cities, because you always have this provincial debate that they uh, complain about spending all the money in Copenhagen. Uh, that was like discarded in round one in the competition. They would never even look at it because it, it was like a silly, it was a sailing sh uh, theater. Um, but I think ha had we put it out now, it would have been met with more, uh, uh, with more careful consideration that uh, maybe these guys actually did the homework. So in a way, the and you're, um, you're helping shift that paradigm also of decision making. We need to move on to the next session, but I'm just thinking if there's one word which sums up each of your presentation, I mean, is yours about assemblage? What's the one word? What's the one word? <laughs> no, because it was very powerful. You're saying assemblage or... Uh, assemblage is uh, maybe one of the words. Uh, legibility. Legibility. I don't say Le it. Legibility. Yours? Uh, Not hedonism, it's obvious. <laughs> uh, uh, I don't know. Concreteness. Okay. <laughs> Can you please thank these wonderful speakers?